Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 581, Gap. Upon witnessing the descent of the thick bluish-green vines, Lumian marveled as if a real carriage could traverse their expanse. It felt like a journey back to a scene from a few years ago when he would listen to his sister's nighttime fairy tales. The dazzling, dreamlike scene and boundless imagination seemed to materialize in reality at that very moment. Ultraman Lotto Gyro sensed imminent danger. The individual capable of such an effect couldn't be a low or mid-sequence bayonder. They had to be a saint who had unlocked the door to godhood. Perhaps even beyond sequence four. Another formidable demigod had entered the scene. Who could it be? Where had they emerged from? This certainly wasn't Gandalf. While others might be unaware, Loki had thoroughly investigated the president of the curly-haired baboons research society, discovering he was a bayonder of the warrior pathway, a warrior who had a penchant for research and mysticism. In the blink of an eye, Lotto Gyro spotted a black shadow racing down the thick green vines. It was an enormous pumpkin drawn by numerous gray mice. A hole atop the orange pumpkin resembled a coach. Within, a vaguely discernible woman sat, adorned in a purple robe, with crystalline heels adorning her feet. A pumpkin coach, mice-drawn carriage, crystal heels, what the fuck is that? Who could it be? Lotto Gyro's pupils dilated, and he couldn't help but inwardly curse with the same words he used most frequently before transmigration. Isn't that Cinderella? Did Roselle actually pen this fairy tale? Why hadn't it gained traction, remaining unknown to most? For a fleeting moment, Lado Gyro grappled with uncertainty, unable to discern whether the newcomer was a demigod aligned with another faction or a concealed powerhouse within the curly-haired baboon's research society. Regaining his composure, he cursed his ill fortune and prepared himself for a confrontation with the enigmatic demigod. Luckily, being the governor of the sea, he could at least temporarily impede the other party in these aquatic surroundings. Prior to the impending clash, Ultraman Lotto Gyro turned his gaze towards Mad Lady. He didn't have time to speak, but his eyes expressed the unspoken message, Hurry up, no time for games. Mad Lady swiftly grasped Ultraman's urgency and with a blink positioned herself at the entrance of the energy passageway. However, instead of materializing precisely there, she outlined her presence. This decision was prompted by the sudden appearance of Mr. Bissi UK and Lumian, seemingly having teleported nearby, with their sights set on the energy passageway's entrance. Splash! Whether from the imposing weight of the humanoid sealed artifact or Lotto Gyro raising his right arm, conjuring a mountainous azure wave, the water around the cave visibly swayed, teetering on the brink of collapse. In that critical moment, Cinderella, seated in the pumpkin carriage, pushed open the door and rose to her feet. She extended her arms, and a massive iron-black cross materialized behind her. The weight of the cross proved challenging for Cinderella to bear, as though it carried the concentrated sins of the entire world. A cross? Ultraman Lotto Gyro was caught off guard as an empty room materialized before him. Within the room, candlelight flickered, revealing a long table adorned with flesh and blood. On either side of the table, three obscure figures hunched over, gnawing and feasting on a gruesome banquet. Abruptly, the three figures turned their heads, fixing their gaze upon Lotto Gyro. He stood frozen, as if their gazes had penetrated his deepest secrets, dismantling them into the essential components of spirit and flesh. A chilling sensation surged from the depths of Lotto Gyro's heart, immediately alerting him to an intense and terrifying malice. However, the source of this malevolence wasn't the newly arrived demigod, but the silver-gray behemoth trapped at the sea's bottom, the very spaceship Lotto Gyro sought to obtain harbored ill intentions towards him. In the blink of an eye, the silver-gray behemoth retracted its authority. Lotto Gyro's status as the governor of the sea plummeted. Despite gaining a new boon, he couldn't ascend to the demigod level. The spaceship had betrayed him. This treachery was a result of the spell Cinderella had just unleashed the Feast of Betrayal. Its purpose was to temporarily awaken or bestow intelligence on a target item, compelling it to commit an act of betrayal. 
Lado Gairo had seamlessly melded with the surrounding waters, harnessing the authority of the governor of the sea on a temporary basis. The spaceship now stood as an entity he had yet to fully master. Objects beyond his full control were prime candidates for betrayal. Cinderella astutely sensed this vulnerability, initiating the feast of betrayal from the outset. Simultaneously, the sealed environment provided the perfect conditions for her to unleash this magic, an act she might not dare attempt elsewhere. In that moment, surprise and fear flooded Lotto Gyro. It felt as though a frigid cascade had drenched him, sending shivers through his entire being. Since merging with the sea and gaining the governor of the sea's authority, Lotto Gyro had believed that ordinary Sequence 4 or even Sequence 3 demigods commonly referred to as saints couldn't swiftly overpower him in this realm. This belief created a sense of parody, but it hinged on him remaining within the waters to fully unleash his strength. Yet, Cinderella's mere magic stripped him of the governor of the sea's authority, relegating him to Sequence 5. Without godhood, mastery over the sea slipped from his grasp. Despite being a dual sequence five of a potion and boon system with numerous unique abilities, Lotto Gyro harbored doubts about facing a genuine demigod. A demigod temporarily shaped from an item proves fragile in the face of a true demigod, so brittle that, once targeted, they wouldn't endure even a breath. Lotto Gyro grappled with the stark realization of the fragility of a true demigod and sank into deep regret and despair. At that moment, the silver-gray behemoth trembled violently, causing the energy passageway at the entrance to flicker and cast its luminance upon Lotto Gyro. With a whoosh, Lotto Gyro found himself hurtling uncontrollably into the spaceship through the pure energy conduit. This was a facet of the spaceship's calculated betrayal aiming to turn the recent authority holder into a mere nutritive substrate within a Petri dish. Lotto Gyro was initially startled, but soon a wave of joy washed over him. An opportunity had presented itself. It allowed him to infiltrate the spaceship, wrest control, and set it in motion. A chance to escape. His misfortune and despair had suddenly transformed into this golden opportunity. Observing the unfolding scene, Lumion wasted no time. He employed Spirit World Traversal once more, reaching the entrance of the energy passageway. Stepping in, he soared into the silver-gray behemoth. Mad Lady trailed closely behind, and Mr. K. K. didn't intervene, instead, he followed suit. Milo Village, Governor of the Sea's Residence. Bard, strategizing an escape plan, was abruptly interrupted by cheers. Cheers, Bard's heart stirred, prompting him to dash out of the servant's room towards the nearest glass window overlooking the dock. There, he observed the gathered villagers. Not a single sea spawn hindered the former governor of the sea during this process. Many villagers raised their hands, seemingly welcoming the waves. As they praised the sea, an almost invisible glow descended, dispersing like water to different individuals. The nearby children joyfully shouted, The sea prayer ritual has succeeded. The sea prayer ritual has succeeded. That's right, it has succeeded, Bard smiled. From the looks of it, Ultraman and Mad Lady have succeeded. The April Fool's key member adjusted the collar of his crisp white shirt and hoisted a brown backpack onto his shoulders. With an unabashed smile, he strolled into the grand hall of the governor of the sea's residence, smoothly making his way out. This time, he encountered no resistance. The guard stationed at the entrance knelt on the ground, expressing gratitude to the sea for its boon. Bard took a detour to the docks, reveling in the genuine joy and praise for the sea. Every time he heard the townsfolk praising the sea and witnessed genuine smiles, his spirits lifted. These fools, they are treating a catastrophe as a cause for celebration. This is a prank, a prank on everyone in Port Santa. Bard closed his eyes in satisfaction and weaved through the crowd, heading deeper into Milo Village. His ultimate destination, the peaks of the Pires mountain range. As a former swindler, Bard orchestrated the Sea Prayer ritual operation, serving as its main planner. The plan's success naturally brought him satisfaction. Crucially, despite taking the most pivotal step in the entire operation, he assumed the least risk and exposure, avoiding direct confrontations. 
navigating through the mix of ancient and modern structures in Milo village, Bard's brow furrowed slightly. A sense of unease settled upon him. Per the initial plan, Ultraman unhindered by strong opposition was supposed to use the second command to open the energy passageway. Relying on his temporary authority as the governor of the sea, he aimed to secure safety for himself and Mad Lady within him. Seizing the opportunity, he planned to eliminate all present and inflict severe injuries on potential demigod adversaries. If powerhouses like Hela emerged and proved resistant to the humanoid-sealed artifact, Ultraman the interim governor of the sea would leap into action, confronting the formidable foes head-on. Mad Lady, wielding her enchanted ring, would harness the potent energy emanating from the spaceship, transforming it into a boon for everyone present, extending its reach to all the children of the sea in Port Santa's vicinity. This strategic move not only allowed them to sidestep danger, but also granted them access to the spaceship, enabling them to activate it. Despite the fact that the people had already received the sea's boon and a few minutes had elapsed, the spaceship remained dormant and the sky showed no signs of change. What had transpired during this interval? With this lingering question, Bard hastened his steps. Tap, tap, tap. Behind him, the faint sound of light footsteps echoed once again. Chapter 582, Efficient Person Locator Port Santa in the City Loki and the unconscious Ludwig had already sought refuge in an apartment that Loki had rented many days earlier. He began manipulating the sealed demigod's spirit body threads. As for his two marionettes, they lurked within a radius of 100 to 200 meters, with Loki as the center, blending in with the various celebrating and passing crowds. They waited to be discovered by Lumian Lee's teammates and the clergymen of the Church of Earth Mother. This was unavoidable. A marionist couldn't allow a marionette to wield their faceless powers. As for the mystical item of the seer pathway, it was in the possession of either Bard or Mad Lady. In the partially destroyed suite of Salomotel, Jenna and Anthony encountered Nolia, the combat nun, and her teammates, who had hurried over. Before this, Lumian had covertly introduced the disguised Jenna and Anthony to Nolia. Hence, the nuns didn't unnecessarily question or apprehend them, they only carefully confirmed each other's identities. Rubio Paco is a fake. He's disguised by a marionist. He has captured Louis Berry's godson. He possesses two marionettes. One is Madame Martha, the Paco family's matriarch. The other's identity and abilities are unknown, Jenner recounted the recent events. She assumed that the fertility order was familiar with the term marionist and didn't delve into unnecessary explanations. Their primary duty was to guard against the Intis Republic to the north, and many official Bayonders of Bureau 8 in the Intis Republic belong to the Seer Pathway. The two sides must have had considerable interactions. Marionist, indeed, upon hearing the sequence name, Nolia frowned slightly is Intis sending spies to disrupt the sea prayer ritual. That's a traitor from Intis's Bureau 8, Jenna explained, her allegiance to Intis stronger than Lumian's. Nolia understood that time was of the essence and she couldn't discuss unrelated matters. She asked the key question, why sees Louis Berry's godson? Is he held as a hostage or does he possess some extraordinary significance? Jenna thought for a moment and revealed the limited information she had just learned. It's a sealed demigod, a creature. Loki will need substantial time to transform him into a marionette, not just a matter of minutes. A demigod? A sealed demigod? That child with the insatiable appetite is a sealed demigod? Nolia's mouth hung open in surprise and astonishment. She almost questioned the reliability of her own ears. The supposed godson of the adventurer Louis Berry is, in fact, a sealed demigod creature. What's his backstory? Why is he wandering around with a sealed demigod creature? Moreover, there's talk of a humanoid sealed artifact, rumored to be at grade one, that recently surfaced in Port Santa. It's on par with a sealed demigod creature. Despite extensive searching, no one has been able to locate it. If not for the disparities in appearance, gender, and age, Nolia might have suspected Ludwig to be the humanoid-sealed artifact that the eternal blazing Sun Church had misplaced. Now, an absurd idea echoed in her mind. 
Is it the current trend to stroll around with sealed demigod creatures? Regaining her composure, Nolia promptly addressed her team members, Semli quickly returned to the order and informed the dean, ask her to deploy all available personnel to the city, locate them as soon as possible. Yes, Madam Martha or Louis Berry's godson, Ludwig. After finding them, unless the situation is exceptionally urgent, refrain from acting recklessly. Report first and await assistance. Considering that the Mariontist had likely altered his appearance and height, and the identity and appearance of his other marionette were unknown, Nolia concentrated her search on Madame Martha, who had become a marionette, and Ludwig, who had been abducted. Yes, Captain, in a bid to save time, the brown-haired Semley darted through the shattered glass window. Utilizing the stone bricks and wood protruding from the outer wall, she leaped from the fifth floor to the street. The dean Nolia referred to was the head of the local cloister, the clergyman overseeing the fertility order in Port Santa, the fertility order's headquarters in Torres, the capital of Gaia province. Just as Semley took a few steps and was about to explore the nearby streets, Jenna, Anthony, Nolia, and the others witnessed a massive bird soaring through the air. The bird's body was grayish-black, its feathers were tough and lacked softness. Its eyes appeared to be adorned with two rubies. The grayish-black bird flapped its wings and glided to the collapsed fifth floor outer wall of Solo Motel. Only then did Jenna and Anthony realize that the grayish-black bird was sculpted from stone. It was weighty, substantial, and unyielding, yet it emanated a vibrant vitality. Perched on the back of the lifelike grayish-black bird was a woman in a brown clergyman's robe. She wore a nun's wimple with wheat patterns and seemed to be in her thirties, but she exuded a maternal aura as if she had nurtured many children. The brown-haired, brown-eyed, mature and stunning clergyman turned her gaze to Nolia and succinctly stated, details. Nolia swiftly echoed Jenna's words. She positioned herself with a slight spread of her legs and raised her hands. Praise the earth, praise the mother of all things. The clergyman was none other than the Archbishop of the Church of Earth Mother's Gaia Diocese, Agrippina. Agrippina nodded gently and uttered, I know Martha from the Paco family. I didn't expect her to meet such a fate. Sigh, may the Earth Mother embrace her soul, and may the flower symbolizing her bloom again next spring. The Archbishop delicately shifted her right foot, conveying a signal to the massive bird sculpted from grayish black stone. The stone bird, pulsating with vitality, flapped its wings and ascended dozens of meters into the air. Agrippina extended her right hand and scattered a handful of dark black seeds the size of rice grains. With a flutter, the port's white-headed seabirds flocked in, covering the sky. Each one gripped a seed in its beak and circled around. They formed a circle within a 300-meter radius. Observing this spectacle, the jubilant citizens of Port Santa, assuming that the seabirds had joined in the celebration of the successful sea prayer ritual, erupted in cheers of delight. After two to three minutes, a solitary combat none spotted Madame Martha. The marionette was concealed on the other side of Aquina Street. Upon receiving the information, Agrippina turned her head and fixed her gaze into the air. Soon, the white-headed seabirds released the rice-sized seeds from their beaks. Agrippina withdrew her gaze and folded her arms across her chest. Each seed that touched the ground instantly sprouted and grew rapidly, morphing into thick dark green vines. Simultaneously, Jenna, Anthony, Nolia, and the others, who were scouring the street for Ludwig and Loki, witnessed the sky darken as if night had prematurely descended or a colossal creature had eclipsed the sunlight. Vaguely, they sensed the presence of a massive pitch-black wing covered in a membrane, casting an illusory aura. In the next moment, a crimson full moon ascended from the night, hanging high in the sky. It seemed as though a tall, slender figure was slowly advancing. Crimson moonlight bathed the area surrounded by the dark green vines, captivating all the citizens like statues. Nourished by the moonlight, the dark green vines swiftly expanded, swiftly encasing the streets around Aquina Street in a forest. Dark red flowers blossomed in the forest, densely clustered and ubiquitous. 
the flowers emitted a faint, sweet fragrance that intermingled, gradually intensifying the scent. Upon inhaling this fragrance, the residents of Port Santa, as well as the rats and bedbugs in the corresponding area, entered a stupor, swaying and collapsing to the ground. Damn it. Jenna understood that Archbishop Agrippina of the Church of Earth Mother was employing indiscriminate tactics to influence the area, aiming to locate and control Loki, but she still cursed internally. This gaseous anesthetic jogged unpleasant memories. In the past, she had nearly fallen victim to a similar gas used by that bliss society pervert. Yet now, in the diffusing gas with a noticeable difference in smell but a similar effect, her head started to spin and her body felt uneasy. The same was true for Anthony and Nolia. One bore dragon-like scales on his skin while the other held her breath. At that moment, three white-headed seabirds descended from the sky, each clutching a metallic bottle, circling Jenna and the others. Nolia glanced at Archbishop Agrippina, who was hovering in midair, and received a nod. Without hesitation, she took the bottle from a white-headed seabird's claw and gulped it down. She swiftly regained consciousness, no longer affected by the gaseous anesthetic. Observing this, Jenna and Anthony accepted the metal bottles and consumed the sour agent. They no longer felt dizzy and weak. The three white-headed seabirds weakly ascended again, landing by the roadside one after another and dozed off. In the area surrounded by the dark green vine forest, only a marionette remained standing at that moment, impervious to the gaseous anesthetic. Its presence was immediately exposed. In the apartment he had pre-rented, Loki was taken aback to discover that controlling the sealed demigod's spirit body threads was much more challenging than he had anticipated. This wasn't a problem that could be resolved in ten minutes. According to his initial estimate, it would take at least an hour. Given the time, the Church of Earth Mother could turn these streets upside down. As the gaseous anesthetic created by the dark green vines and dark red flowers permeated the room, Loki's initial impulse was to craft an air straw nearly 30 meters long and extend it high into the air to breathe fresh air. However, he quickly dismissed the idea. Perhaps the demigod of the Church of Earth Mother was waiting to detect similar traces to pinpoint his location. Moreover, Loki had realized that there was more than one demigod in the sky. If there was only one, he could rely on sealed artifacts, bestowments, and other means to concentrate. He could conceal himself in the shadows and contend with them to see if he could endure until the marionette-making process was completed. However, there were at least two demigods observing. More importantly, he could endure for about ten minutes, but an hour was out of the question. After weighing the pros and cons, Loki abandoned his original plan to conduct the ritual today and advanced to sequence for Bizarro Sorcerer. In any case, as long as he could restrain the sealed demigod, he could find another opportunity in the future. There was no need for him to perform today. Why would it take an hour or more? Is this a demigod's spirit body threads? Amidst Loki's confusion, he didn't intend to recall the two marionettes. He planned on using the mystical item to teleport away. From his pocket, he retrieved a bracelet made of different colored gems. Just as Loki was about to activate a diamond, he heard the sound of swallowing. Loki instinctively lowered his head and looked into his arms, realizing that Ludwig had awakened at some point. With a sincere expression, the boy spoke with a hint of eagerness, I'm hungry. Chapter 583 Celestial Worthy's Revelation Around the betrothal ship and sailboat, thick turquoise vines cascaded from the sky. They entwined, creating a road leading to various destinations. Cinderella returned to the orange-yellow pumpkin coach, pulled by gray mice swiftly descending through the vines. They approached the energy passageway formed by pure light, as if about to enter the silver-gray behemoth embedded in the seabed. Abruptly, the mischief of gray mice came to a halt. Cinderella, adorned in a purple robe, wore a solemn expression, purple spots dancing in her pupils. Cinderella sensed an unusually perilous presence deep within the silver. Gray behemoth. It remained motionless, as if in a deep slumber or long dead. 
However, in either case, her intuition warned her not to approach, lest she suffer severe corruption or similar effects. Staring at the energy passageway where Lumion and company had vanished, she deliberated for a few seconds before shifting her focus to the sailboat. With Mr. Menace Fool's seal on the Seven of Wands and the sealed evil god's angel, he didn't have to worry about the problem that even she had to be wary of as long as he didn't directly see those things, hear its voice, or enter the core area. As for the other one, he seemed to be a shepherd, so he didn't mind being even crazier. Cinderella observed the mast and shipboard of the sailboat cracking under the terrifying suction of the humanoid sealed artifact's heaviness characteristic. She was ready to make her move when she retrieved a Roselle chess piece from her dark purple coin bag and hurled it at the target in the black nun's attire. Amidst the howling wind, the queen chess piece soared towards the humanoid sealed artifact accompanied by various miscellaneous items. As it descended, the humanoid sealed artifact steps towards the sailboat slowed, as if time itself was warping around her. This was one of the spells of Cinderella, the chessboard of ages. It had the power to decelerate the target as if they had entered an area where time moved at a different speed. Seizing the opportunity presented by the sluggish movement, Cinderella closed her eyes and transformed into a humanoid phantom, collapsing into the invisible coffin. The eyelids of the humanoid sealed artifact drooped as if she might succumb to sleep at any moment. Sleeping Beauty Magic Witnessing this Hela aboard the sailboat once again activated the Evernight Pathway's ability to forcibly drag people into a dream. Although the notarization wouldn't immediately expire with Ultraman Lotto Gyro's loss of the Governor of the Sea Authority, it would still last until the end. However, the ability to be invalidated by notarization wasn't entirely ineffective. It would only be weakened, and its effects would be significantly reduced. Now, the humanoid sealed artifact was already fatigued, swaying, and on the verge of falling asleep. In this state, entering a dream was undoubtedly much easier. The humanoid sealed artifact, donned in a black nun's attire, finally closed her eyes and plunged into a deep slumber. She entered a somewhat sorrowful dream, causing her face to contort slightly as she frowned. On the sailboat, a dense darkness surged once more, enveloping the humanoid sealed artifact, resonating with a distant voice that brought peace and tranquility. It was akin to a mother reciting a poem to lull her child to sleep, fostering a serene slumber. The humanoid sealed artifact, still in her black nun's attire, hovered in midair with her eyes tightly shut. She descended slowly, landing gracefully on the deck of the sailboat. Her brows gradually relaxed, her face softened, and crystalline water droplets formed at the corners of her eyes. The maidens of the sea, deputy hosts and sailors, blessed by the sea and adorned with starlight scales, swiftly settled in the darkness, succumbing to sleep amidst the enchanting chanting. Franca, within the sail cabin, was taken aback by the unfolding battle. I isn't that Cinderella? I isn't that Jack and the Beanstalk? What manner of magic is this? I isn't that Sleeping Beauty? Who is this? Have I arrived in a fairyland? I have to admit, it's truly dreamlike. Two demigods working together are undoubtedly formidable. They swiftly subdued the humanoid sealed artifact. I also wish to become a demigod. A demoness demigod would do too. Regaining her senses, Franca concealed herself and sprinted out of the sailboat. Utilizing her run-up and an assassin's feather fall, she elegantly leaped onto the betrothal ship, intending to approach the energy passageway at the bow. Within the Silver Grey Behemoth After Lumion traversed the energy passageway, he found himself not in the metal beehive he had seen before. Walking on the silvery white metal floor, he noticed a hall dozens of meters long and twenty to thirty meters wide ahead. In the middle of the hall, Ultraman Lotto Gyro stood, donning Simon Gyro's face, and shouted in delight. This represented the first half of the command to activate the spaceship by entering the password and gaining access. However, there was no response from the spaceship. Crap, it still holds ill intentions towards me and isn't willing to grant access. This malice stems from that demigod's ability. It shouldn't last long. As long as I can stall for time, I should be able to regain control. 
Can the humanoid sealed artifact hold back two demigods? Or can I rely on the spaceship's internal layout to play hide and seek? A series of thoughts raced through Ultraman's anxious mind. At that moment, through the translucent metal wall to the side of the hall, he saw Cinderella in the pumpkin coach come to a halt near the energy passageway, seemingly apprehensive about something. As expected, she doesn't dare to enter. Exhilaration surged from Ultraman Lotto Gyro's heart. Before the mission kicked off, Loki had set up an altar and sought guidance from Celestial Worthy through divination. The response he got was, contains a high risk from high-ranking individuals, avoidable by entering the spaceship. Loki decoded this as a warning about Hela and Gandalf from the curly-haired baboons research society, as well as the saint from the Church of Earth Mother overlooking Port Santa. These high-ranking figures were the primary threats. However, if he could take the reins of the mystical sci-fi spaceship first, he believed he could outmaneuver these formidable opponents. Now, Lotto Gyro noticed that even without absolute control of the spaceship, the new demigod hesitated, as if haunted by an unseen fear. Facing something capable of unsettling a demigod left Lotto Gyro uneasy. However, armed with the spaceship's command and password, he could soon turn potential threats to his advantage. There was no need for fear. As Lumion was on the brink of teleporting behind Ultraman Lotto Gyro, they both heard a metallic clang. A silver metal door descended, sealing off the hall's entrance and exit completely. The walls, ceiling, and floor transformed as metal surfaces shifted and revealed dark pipe openings. Out gushed cerulean blue gas. Poison gas. Lotto Gyro's heart raced as he grasped the situation. The spaceship, still imbued with malice, not only resisted control but also emanated lethal intent, seeking to eliminate him before its animosity subsided. The magic of the demigod outside is malicious indeed. Lumion perceived this as an instinctive strike from the silver-gray behemoth against intruders. Swiftly, he tapped into the power of the sea, aiming to invoke the temporary authority of the governor of the sea to counter the threat. He could sense that Ultraman had lost the Governor of the Sea's position after the attack from the Cinderella demigod, with no immediate prospect of reclaiming it. With no contenders for the authority, Lumion anticipated an easy acquisition. Yet, the waters resisted, refusing Lumion the temporary position of Governor of the Sea. Its malice seemed directed at anyone attempting control. Undeterred, Lumion shifted his focus back to Ultraman Lotto Gyro, a crucial member of April Fools. Lotto Gyro's heart stirred as he shouted, Do you want to fight here? If we don't break out and waste no time, we'll all die. In this dire moment, a plan to escape the hall and relocate became paramount. The malice wouldn't linger for long. Seek vengeance in a safe space. If we perish here, who will assist in eliminating the others? Lumion nonchalantly flexed his wrists, donning the flog boxing gloves, and grinned, stating, I don't care about my own death. All that matters now is one thing, ending you. As the words left his lips, crimson flames, bordering on white, erupted from his entire being as if he were cloaked in a fiery shroud. Not far from Lumion and Lotto Gyro, Mad Lady and Mr. King K found themselves in the beehive like metal room, unable to enter the hall ahead. Surveying the surroundings, Mr. K's gaze swept across the incubating baitings, black insect, little devils, and other creatures. He nodded in satisfaction. It's indeed the power of an evil god, spawn of an evil god. Well done, Lumion, well done. This is all part of God's arrangement. Amidst the hoarse voice, the Aurora Order Oracle turned his gaze back to Mad Lady. Mad Lady wasn't intimidated. Instead, she applauded in agreement with Mr. K. She spoke as if they were on different frequencies. That's right, it's cool, right? This is a spaceship. In the next moment, Mad Lady and Mr. Dis K vanished simultaneously and reappeared behind where the other party had been standing, as if they had negotiated a position switch beforehand. Chapter 584 Helper Inside the underwater spaceship in the Silvery Hall Lumion, enveloped by crimson, nearly white flames, transformed into a fireball and hurtled towards Ultraman Lotto Gyro. 
The key April Fool's member remained composed. Holding his breath, he thrust forward with his left palm. Lumion instantly sensed an invisible force resisting him, causing the blazing crimson fireball to decelerate abruptly, akin to a trapped insect in transparent amber. Seizing the moment, Lotto Gyro raised his right hand, clenching it into a fist. A ball of blazing white pure sunlight condensed and compressed, swiftly morphing into a thick, formidable laser aimed at Lumion, fused with the crimson near white fireball. This ability resulted from merging the sun pathway and the sea boon, utilizing the power of the sun pathway to propel the sea boon's weakening ray. Though it no longer altered the target's body gradually, causing various negative symptoms, its penetration and melting effects were significantly enhanced, capable of directly injuring or even killing the target. In the enclosed, poisonous gas-filled environment with a constant threat of malice, Lotto Gyro sought to conclude the battle swiftly rather than wait for Lumian Lee to weaken gradually. Thus, he opted for Sun Ray instead of Weakening Ray. At laser speed, Sun Ray struck the Crimson Fireball, melting a substantial hole into it. The fireball lost its structural integrity and exploded, scattering like rain. Yet, Lumion was nowhere among the remnants, he seemed to have vanished into thin air. Simultaneously, behind Ultraman Lotto Gyro, Lumion's figure, adorned with the lie earring, swiftly materialized. Initially, Lumion transformed into a fireball and soared towards Lotto Gyro, intending to force him into using Bayonder powers and counterattack. This allowed him to fix his original location, not shifting prematurely, creating an opportunity to teleport behind the target in the fireball state for a surprise attack. Having faced Bestowed of the Sea before, Lumion was aware of Lotto Gyro's ability to manipulate the weight or flotation of objects using the power of the land and stars, altering their speed. To successfully use Spirit World Traversal in his fireball form, Lumion borrowed Lai's flame-controlling ability. As his figure materialized, he promptly opened his mouth and hissed at Ultraman Lotto Gyro, less than two meters away. Ha! Ah. A pale yellow beam, resembling gas, shot towards the April Fool's key member. Lotto Gyro didn't have time to turn around, sensing the impending danger through his fate perception, a skill obtained from deciphering the language of the star's Bayonder powers. Specks of starlight emerged in his eyes, he identified several passages in the Silver Hall suffused with cerulean blue gases, imperceptible to ordinary humans. Hastily choosing one, he pounced over a navigating ability bestowed by the sea. Simultaneously, uncertain of evading the attack from behind, Lado Gyro infused the surroundings with layers of golden light. This was the purification halo of a Sequence 5 Priest of Light of the Sun Pathway. Amidst the harem, the pale yellow beam swept past Lotto Gyro's back, hidden somewhere in the void. The key member of April Fools, code name Ultraman, fainted, but his momentum remained. He continued into the illusory passageway, hidden from ordinary eyes, traversing space and dimensions. Lumion, within two meters, couldn't teleport away in time and was enveloped by the purification halo. His heart ached, as if something sought to tear his body apart and crawl out. Faintly, he heard the illusory ravings of the entity known as Inevitability, Mr. Fool, or both. Unclear but unsettling, they made Lumian's brain feel pulled out of his skull by an invisible hand. Despite an ascetic's endurance, Lumian couldn't help but groan in pain. Collapsing to the ground, he curled up. A similar experience occurred in his Cordu dream, a reaction after being sprinkled by Valentine's holy water. Lotto Gyro's purification halo, an advanced sun halo, had evolved from harmless to a partial sun holy water effect. It could exercise evil spirits and purify the evil power within a target's body. As Lotto Gyro lay unconscious, the purification halo vanished in a flash, only partially dispelling the poisonous gas. Similarly, the unconscious Lotto Gyro couldn't progress through the illusory passageway, breaking free and falling three to four meters in front of Lumion. The impact left him in pain, slowly regaining consciousness. At that moment, Lumion slowly recovered from the intense pain induced by the purification halo. 
Lotto Gyro, just waking up and still uncertain of the situation, instinctively re-entered the illusory passageway to increase the distance between himself and Lumian Lee. This move aimed to avoid another strike from Lumian's psychic piercing-like ability or any other unforeseen attacks. Upon crawling back to the hall through the exit of the illusory passageway, Lumian had already raised his head and regained his composure, though his forehead was soaked in cold sweat. Observing this, Lotto Gyro felt neither pity, disappointment, nor regret. Instead, he was pleasantly surprised. It's effective. Purification Halo is effective against Lumian Lee. After confirming that the adventurer Louis Berry was indeed Lumian Lee, Lotto Gyro contemplated how to strategize if he were to engage in a battle with him. It was simple with the authority of the Governor of the Sea. He could repeatedly cast the other party into the cosmic void, making him lose himself over and over. Without the Governor of the Sea's authority, he had to consider how to exploit Lumian Lee's vulnerabilities. Lumian Lee's unique characteristics were clear possessing a sealing power of the same origin as the Celestial Worthy, with a high-ranking creature sealed within him. Beyonders in this state often had false high-level statuses and enjoyed numerous conveniences, but they were susceptible to the Sun Pathway's abilities. Lotto Gyro wasn't certain about the effectiveness of the Sun Halo, Cleave of Purification, and other abilities, nor was he sure of the Purification Halo's potency. The only certainty lay in the effectiveness of the Sun Holy Water he could create. Therefore, if the Purification Halo proved ineffective against Lumian Lee, he would swiftly produce Sun Holy Water and sprinkle it on him. Looking at Lumian, Lotto Gyro smiled, once again dyeing the surroundings golden as layer after layer spread out. This sealed environment was ideal for employing the purification halo. It denied Lumian Lee a chance to distance himself or teleport closer. The entire hall was essentially enveloped by the purification halo. Furthermore, in the spaceship, there was no fear of Lumian Lee losing control and transforming into a monster, unleashing the high-level creature within his body. An intruder at this level would inevitably trigger the spaceship's automatic defense system targeting him. Lotto Gyro might then seize control of the spaceship. Didn't your sister tell you something Emperor Roselle once said? If you rely on something to obtain specialness and become stronger, you will definitely be punished because of it. Upon seeing the surging layers of golden light, Lumian raised his right hand and vanished. Where is he teleporting to this time? As long as he's in the hall, he can't avoid the purification halo. Lotto Gyro watched the other parties struggle with certainty and a smile. Unless Lumian Lee chose to leave the hall, it was impossible for him not to be affected by the purification halo. With the spaceship's barrier raised, the door closed and the place sealed, and using the unique power of the sea, if he wanted to teleport out, he had to first destroy the surrounding walls or metal doors to create an exit. This was also advantageous for Lotto Gyro. No one knew what the spaceship would unleash in this hall next. Layer after layer of purification halos rapidly drowned Lumian's original location, but nothing happened. Lumian's figure was nowhere to be seen in the silver-white hall. W.H. Lotto Gyro's pupils constricted. Where did Lumian Lee go? Is his teleportation ability unaffected by the sealed interior of the spaceship? Or has he gone into hiding? Lotto Gyro's heart skipped a beat, he extended his right hand and pulled. The void in the hall stirred, unveiling an abnormal area nestled between two walls, flanked by dark holes emitting cerulean blue gas, creating an unstable space and hiding inside to avoid the purification halo. That's true. The purification halo's purpose is to exercise, purify, warm, and provide courage. Without substantial offensive power, it can't destroy the structure of that space. Lumian Lee actually possesses such an ability. Lotto Gyro quickly saw through Lumian's trick. Calmly raising his right hand, he condensed a penetrating dark green ray. Simultaneously, he harnessed his basic control over gravity to pull at the fabricated space. The dark green ray struck the spot where it had been pulled, instantly penetrating and obliterating the structure. Silently shattered, the dark green ray continued forward, hitting a silver. White full body armor with its back turned to Lotto Gyro. 
the dark green ray, now weakened to a certain extent, faded away. The silver-white full-body armor suddenly pivoted and two pairs of eyes appeared to lock onto Lotto Gyro from within the vacant helmet. In the next moment, it charged toward the April Fool's key member, forming a broadsword of light in its hand. As the silver-white full-body armor rushed out, Lumion's figure emerged in the corner. He had utilized the terrain there to arrange a simple bottle of fiction, using the large hole that emitted poisonous gas as a symbolic window. His goal was twofold. First, to evade the influence of the purification halo, and second, to position the pride armor with its back facing Lotto Gyro. Yes, this cursed armor might only target someone standing a certain distance behind it, but it might not. What if that person not only stood more than 10 meters behind it, but also attempted to attack it by stabbing it in the back? The answer was clear. Now, Lumion had a capable helper unafraid of the purification halo. Chapter 585, Repeated Betrayal At a distance of just over 10 meters, the pride armor covered the ground in two powerful strides, positioning itself in front of Ultraman Lotto Gyro. A broadsword, condensed from radiant light, slashed down with deadly precision. Lotto Gyro had a momentary opportunity to utilize his navigator ability, escape through hidden passageways in the void and dimensions, and evade the impending attack. However, the sight of the silver-white full-body armor caught him off guard. He hadn't anticipated an aggressive move before Lumian Lee could even don the armor. This momentary hesitation cost him. The silver-white full-body armor, resembling a relentless steam locomotive, collided with him before he could vanish into the hidden tunnel. By then, it was too late, and the looming threat of being cleaved apart became imminent, a grim fate of upper and lower halves separated. In this dire circumstance, he was no earthworm with regenerative abilities, his fate seemed sealed. Facing the approaching silver-white armor and its raised broadsword of light, scales formed from starlight protruded from various parts of Lotto Gyro's body. The air quivered around him, as if an invisible tide were roaring, amplifying the tension. As per the intel gathered on April Fools, the power derived from the sea, without the governor of the sea's authority corresponded to a sequence five at most, known as Tidal Scholar the current state of Lotto Gyro. Enveloped by an ethereal tide, Lotto Gyro swung his fist, resembling a colossal wave crashing down. Thud, his formidable punch collided with the side of the broadsword of light, forcefully diverting its trajectory. Simultaneously, Lumian materialized behind him, left hand raised. Indeed, I knew you'd seize this chance to teleport behind me and launch a sneak attack. Lotto Gyro was ready. Evading the silver-white full-body armor's second strike, he imbued the surroundings in a warm golden hue. Purification Halo As layers of golden light surged towards Lumion, he deftly twisted his left wrist. Even before that, the silver-white lie earring on his left earlobe emitted a subtle glow, revealing various blobs of light and colors on Ultraman's body. Among them, a golden ball emitted a warm glow, the representation of the purification halo ability. With a flick of his wrist, the golden ball detached from Ultraman's body and swiftly flew to Lumion. Steel. Lumion successfully stole Ultraman's purification halo. The number of times the ring of the Sea Queen could steal after the standard process remained unknown to Lumion. However, he was certain that Lai's stealing effect persisted for half a month, unaffected by his stealing of the sea's power. After Lai's transformation on the ancestral altar in Milo Village, Lumion diligently experimented with steel, honing his proficiency to ensure he could deploy it effectively in critical moments. Thus, he had become relatively adept at stealing and dispersing the power of the sea. Simultaneously, Ultraman's Bayonder powers of the Sun Pathway were well documented by the Tarot Club's information, making Lumion fully aware of what he aimed to steal this time. With a solid foundation in mysticism knowledge, he felt prepared. However, the challenge lay in his lack of experience stealing a Priest of Light's abilities. He feared that locating the corresponding symbols for purification halo and holy water creation might take too long, leaving him vulnerable to Lotto Gyro's attacks. 
anticipating the Pride Armor's frontal assault, Lumian strategically teleported four to five meters behind Lotto Gyro, enticing him to use Purification Halo. The distinction between the abilities Lumian used and those he refrained from was clear, providing him with instant recognition. Before initiating the teleport, he activated the lie earring and raised his left hand, ensuring he didn't linger in the dangerous area for a moment longer. The purification halo, despite being stolen, persisted and continued to surge, enveloping Lumion. However, it didn't reach its intended target. A formidable formless force emanated from Lumion's body, acting as a barrier that thwarted the encroaching halo. The power of the sea. You have the power of the sea, and so do I. During the steel process, Lumion had reserved a portion of the sea's power for himself. Although not on par with Ultramans, it proved sufficient to repel the purification halo for a brief moment. Calmly activating the black mark on his right shoulder, Lumion vanished from the warm golden area, teleporting to the farthest corner from Lado Gyro. The purification halo pursued relentlessly, but it reached its limit, visibly weakening. Reacting swiftly, Lumion harnessed the power of the sea once more, watching as the warm golden barrier rapidly dissipated. Meanwhile, Lotto Gyro's heart skipped a beat. Intuitively, he sensed the loss of his purification halo ability, suspecting it had been stolen. Lumion Lee's item with the steel effect is still operational. Lotto Gyro couldn't dwell on it. Dodging the pride armor's heavy slashes, he fell to the ground, rolling to evade the attacks. Facing the sky, he raised his right hand, clenching it. Pure and blazing sunlight condensed rapidly, forming a thick ray that struck the silver-white armor's chest. It paused momentarily, unable to penetrate, only burning and dissolving into tottering black marks. Witnessing this and recognizing Lumian Lee as his adversary, Ultraman Lado Gyro entertained the idea of fleeing. He decided to disengage, cease the confrontation, and seek an escape route. At that critical moment, instead of launching a barrage of attacks, the pride armor shifted its focus toward Lumian. Lumian, who had previously utilized Spirit World Traversal on the betrothal ship and within the hall, found himself affected once again by the purification halo. His spirituality teetered on the brink of depletion, leaving him visibly fatigued and weakened. Any ordinary human in such a state near the pride armor would face indiscriminate attacks. W.H. Lotto Gyro keenly perceived the shift in dynamics. Though unaware of the specifics, he sensed an advantage. Rising abruptly, he directed his attention to Lumion. In the next instant, the pride armor raised its radiant broadsword and charged towards Lumion. Ha ha, your sealed artifact has betrayed you. Lotto Gyro mocked internally as he closed in, intending to exploit the silver-white full-body armor's attack to create sun-holy water and sprinkle it on Lumion Lee. Undeterred, Lumion took a resolute step forward. Tapping into his ascetic powers, the accumulated strength and spirituality within his body surged, replenishing his drained spirit. His body underwent a sudden transformation, growing by seven to eight centimeters and bulking up by two sizes, causing his loosely fitting deputy host's robe to strain. The advancing pride armor abruptly halted, pivoting to face Lotto Gyro, who had followed closely. Lotto Gyro's pupils contracted, and an instant heaviness enveloped his body, bringing him to a natural halt. Simultaneously, his gaze locked onto the unusually tall figure of Lumian Lee. The enemy teleported right in front of him, mere inches away. Their eyes locked, reflecting each other in an intense confrontation. With a swift whoosh, Lumian swung his right hand, adorned with the flog boxing gloves, through the air. Lotto Gyro's heavy state naturally exerted a suction force on his surroundings, a downgraded version of the humanoid sealed artifact's characteristic. Lumion's punch encountered no repulsion, instead it accelerated towards its target. Unperturbed by the close-range attacks, Lotto Gyro harbored concerns about Lumion's psychic piercing ability. Unable to dodge or employ other abilities in time, he unleashed a retaliatory fist resembling a thousand tons of seawater, causing the sound of surging tides to echo. Bang! Lotto Gyro blocked Lumion's attack and swiftly rolled to the side, evading a surprise assault from the pride armor. 
At that moment, a strong sense of greed surged within him, overshadowing his initial plan to escape. Seizing the opportunity, Lumian retreated and retrieved a black bone flute with red holes from his traveler's bag. Symphony of Hatred While Lotto Gyro resisted the pride armor, Lumian brought the flute to his mouth and played a sharp, intense melody. Lotto Gyro's mind buzzed, freezing him in place. Bright blood oozed from the cracks in the starlight scales on his body. Emotional Detonation PFFT, the pride armor struck Lotto Gyro's shoulder, splintering scales, bone, and flesh. Closing the distance with two brisk strides, Lumian approached the nearly collapsed Lotto Gyro, his face twisted in pain. He raised the black bone flute in his hand. In the moment that Lotto Gyro used the pain from the pride armor strike to break free from the detonated emotions, he witnessed Lumian Lee thrusting the bone flute toward him with a fierce expression. PFFT. The bone flute effortlessly pierced Lotto Gyro's left eye, akin to cutting through butter. The eyeball of April Fool's key member exploded, and a gruesome mix of blood and other fluids streamed out through the gaps in the black bone flute. Even if the symphony of hatred only struck an ordinary part, it was tantamount to hitting a vital point. Striking a true vital point meant either instant death or a prolonged period of social death. In this case, Lotto Gyro's left eye and brain were undeniably vital points. His remaining eye widened and protruded, life force rapidly draining as he slumped to the ground. Lumian seized Ultraman's neck, lifting him up. Releasing his right hand, which held the black bone flute, he delivered a heavy slap to Lotto Gyro's face. With a fierce expression, he growled in intision, Did you go to Kordu village to confirm the situation?